So while Debbie's bringing up her slide, just let me say it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Debbie Parikh. Debbie's an associate professor in the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech, and she's also a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. Her interests encompass computer vision, natural language processing, embodied AI, human AI collaboration, and AI for creativity. She's earned many prestigious awards for her very distinguished research program. Just to name a few, an NSF Career Award, an Ijkai Computers and Thought Award, a Sloan Fellowship, four Google Faculty Research Awards, an Amazon Academic Research Award. She's on the Forbes list of 20 incredible women advancing <laughs> AI research. And she's also won a MAR Best Paper Prize at ICCV. So just a tremendously distinguished research career. And thank you so much, Debbie, for joining our workshop today. And please, everyone, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Debbie. <laughs> thank you, Swan. That is a that is a very kind introduction. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I take it you can see my title slide in full screen. Right? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, in the last few years, I've been uh, quite excited about uh, seeing if we can use AI for augmenting human creativity. Um, and I think this is exciting for a couple of reasons. One is that creativity is at the core of all progress we make um, and sort of creative expression is a, is a deeply human experience. Um, and so it seems like if we can use technology, if we can use AI to augment this experience in some way, to augment human creativity in some way, um, that could be quite neat. Um, and so in this space, I've been dabbling in a variety of uh, different things, things like if we are given as input a piece of music and we produce um, patterns that move in sync with the music. And so it looks a little bit like we're, we're generating dance. So for example, um, here's an example output of that. Um, Um, and the nice thing about, I won't get into the details of this approach, but the nice thing about this approach is that it's independent of the actual visual. It doesn't care what the visual is. It's just sort of looping through a sequence of a few frames that you might have. And so the same approach can be used to also produce a stick figure that might be moving in sync uh, with music like you see here. Um, and then it was also tempting to go the other way, where if we have as input um, a dance, like you see here, can we produce music uh, that is in sync with it? And here the music is, is, is very simple music, it's just a pentatonic scale, um, but this is what that looks like. Um, and we've also done some work on um, sort of thematic typography that if someone gives you as input a word like book and a theme like library, can we write the word out book by using icons um, that reflect the theme, in this case, library. Um, here are a few more examples of that, of car with the theme driving and road and signs of the word witch in the theme Halloween, um, of the word play with the theme Olympics. Um, We've also done some work on if someone describes um, their day in, in some sentences, um, can we automatically extract the topics they're talking about? Can we automatically extract the emotions they might be describing and generate these sort of abstract visualizations of those topics and the corresponding emotions um, and, and things of that sort. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about those things in, the de in, in detail. Um, I, I should have said that earlier, so the organizers weren't freaking out that I'm not gonna talk about sketches. Um, but yeah, so today in my talk, I'm gonna focus on two projects in the context of sketching and, and in particular collaborative sketching. Um, so the first one is uh, where we were studying human collaboration um, in the context of sketches. So these are uh, humans collaborating with each other to generate sketches. And so we had this, uh, what we, the setup that we were looking at is that you start with this blank canvas and one person comes in and adds a set of strokes. 
somebody else comes in and adds more strokes to it, a third person comes in and adds more strokes. And through this, in this case, we're looking at 30 different people who are incrementally and sequentially contributing um, to this sketch that is being uh, created over time. And we were interested in studying some collaboration mechanisms in this setup to see what leads to more interesting uh, sketches. Um, and so there were a few interesting things about this that, for example, we noticed that in some cases, you might think that a sketch is going in a certain direction, but then based on what somebody else comes in and draws, it kind of goes a different way. So here's one example where at one point in the sequence, this is what the incomplete sketch looked like. And to me, at least it had seemed like that this is probably gonna be, maybe it's a house, maybe it's a home, we'll see more objects, maybe some people in there, and that's how the story will proceed. Um, but the next person who came in decided to draw this cat that is sort of outside this house and it's raining um, on the cat. And so that became the focus. But now there's this other creature that's holding up an umbrella for the cat and not much changed on the interior on the inside of this home, um, which was interesting. Um, here's another example where at first it's unclear um, what the person might be trying to draw, um, if at all they had something in mind, and then it becomes even more unclear and then someone else comes in and sort of thinks that this could potentially be an animal in the red strokes. And so they add more features to that to make that uh, more clear. And then someone comes in and then emphasizes that even more that this is the thing that we could be building on and it, and it goes forward from there. Um, here's one last example of that where initially it's, I don't know if you would see something here, but then someone comes in and sort of um, emphasizes certain pieces of it and the, and the story or the sketch kind of goes forward from there. Um, so that that so that was interesting in itself. Um, but going back to the collaboration mechanism, um, what the uh, the setup that we decided to look at was: on one hand, you can have just one person sketching the whole thing out. Um, on the other hand, you can have this completely free form collaboration. But like I said, everyone just comes in and sketches whatever they want. Um, and the third setting that we looked at was this um, collaborative setting that has a voting mechanism in there where at any stage, at, um, at any stage of this incomplete sketch, we have five people um, come in and add to it. Um, it. So actually, let me take a step back. So at any stage, we have five versions of an incomplete sketch. And the next person that comes in gets to look at these five versions and pick which one they want to add more strokes to. So in this case, the person decided that, uh, so in this case, five people decided that they want to add more strokes to this version two people decided that they want to add more strokes to this version and so on. And whichever version gets is the first one to get five people who want to contribute to it. That version is what moves forward and the others are discarded. And the five uh, people who had added to it, so now you have five versions of that sketch and that's your next set of choices that the next set of people will see. And so in this case, this version was the first one to get five more sketches. And so that's the one that got propagated and the rest got discarded. Um, and so, so you're interested in comparing what these three different collaboration uh, mechanisms can give you. Um, and here's, here's samples of what we get. So on, on the left, you're seeing what happens if just one person is sketching everything out. Um, and you see that there is sort of variance in quality. Some of these are fairly high quality, complete sketches, and then others sort of, I think most people would say that aren't as high quality. Um, and the second thing is that even perhaps among the ones that are higher quality, the content and the subject is maybe a little bit more predictable where sort of you have a sketch of a bird, you have a sketch of this outdoor sunset scene um, that, that might be expected. Um, if the, on the other end of the spectrum, if you have this completely free form collaboration where everyone is just coming in and adding their own strokes, you have qualitatively very different sketches. Um, they're, if you sort of, you can look at each one and study them and think about what's going on, they're all quite interesting and rich, um, but it also feels like they're also quite chaotic and noisy as a consequence of um, that anyone can sort of come in and change the course or add a bunch of strokes that take it a different way. Um, and then this is what we have if we have this voting-based collaborative system. I should say that this only had 20 levels that were added to it as opposed to 30, because this version is much more expensive because five different people, in the worst case, you can have 24 sketches that are being uh, created at each level and you only keep five and throw the rest away. Um, but this is what you get where um, it seems like they are uh, fairly rich, 
uh, fairly interesting, similar to the collaborative setting in the middle. Um, but that at the same time, they are also somewhat coherent um, and a little bit cleaner, if you will, uh, than, than what you're seeing in the, in the center. Um, and so we tried to evaluate this. Um, and so we had a whole bunch of uh, uh, measures that you're seeing here. Um, we also had an additional uh, setting that I haven't uh, talked about. So I'll drop that from here and I'll focus only on these first four measures of uh, things like which, uh, given a pair of sketches, which uh, sketch seems more unusual, uh, which sketch just seems uh, better on the right is uh, which uh, uh, sketch is more creative. Um, and what we find is that um, in terms of the quality, so which sketch uh, uh, do you like better, which sketch sort of looks better, um, we are seeing fairly high variance on the individuals, which is what we had talked about earlier as well, that depending on the skill and motivation of an individual who's making the whole sketch, the quality of the sketch can be fairly different. Um, whereas on uh, in terms of being unusual or sort of different, unexpected, those individual sketches rate fairly low. Um, like I said, that they sometimes tend to be somewhat predictable and somewhat boring. Um, whereas, uh, in term, and so overall in terms of creativity, that how creative is the sketch, um, or given two sketches, which sketch is more creative? Um, this is where the overall uh, creativity falls for these individual sketches. Um, on the other hand, if you look at uh, the collaborative setting, um, they are highly unpredictable, interesting, unusual, um, the quality uh, doesn't get rated very highly. Like I said, that they look fairly chaotic and noisy. Um, and overall, this is where the creativity rating falls. Um, and finally, if you look at the collaborative plus voting, the mechanism that I showed with, that has the voting in it, um, you do end up compromising on the uh, unusualness a little bit compared to the fully collaborative setting. They're not quite as uh, uh, sort of yeah, unpredictable but the quality is much higher. So all that the noisiness and the chaos uh, reduces significantly and overall it rates the highest in terms of these sketches uh, being creative. And this is something that we found um, multiple times across projects and has been talked about in the computational creativity literature quite a bit uh, in, in terms of how you can think about creativity as this combination of novelty and value. And one way of interpreting that is to say, that novelty relates to, is it surprising, is it unusual, and value relates to uh, some notion of quality. Um, and so we are seeing that get played out in these evaluations as well. All right, um, so the next project that I wanna talk about um, also in the context of sketching um, is this work that we had at iClear last year on creative sketch generation. Um, and the motivation behind this work actually came from this artist um, on Instagram who has these, what I think are wonderful, delightful, um, fantastical depictions of uh, creatures um, along with this little caption that they, that they add to it. Um, and so we were curious to see if this is something um, that like, can we even, like what would it look like if we tried to get AI models to approach uh, something like this? I, we knew that we weren't gonna get anywhere close to this, but trying to approach something like this. Um, and so at the time, the data sets that we found in the context of sketches um, looked more like this, where they were fairly realistic depictions um, of uh, various, uh, uh, various objects. In this case, we're looking at birds, as opposed to these more fantastical depictions of birds and creatures that we were interested in. Um, so what we did was, do, so we wanted to collect a data set that has these fantastical depictions. And so what we did was, and so something that looks like this is, is what we were interested in collecting. And these are examples from our data set. Um, and so what we did is we set up this interface that starts with a blank canvas and a random initial stroke. Um, so like you see here, and then uh, we tell, uh, this is on Mechanical Turk. And so we tell Turkers to, after given this random initial stroke to draw an eye uh, wherever they want. So draw an eye arbitrarily on this canvas. And so in this case, this is where, uh, so this is actually me doing it. And so this is where I decided to draw the eye. And then we instruct them to sort of take a step back, look at this, and think about how with this stroke and with this eye, um, in, in what way can there be a bird or a creature uh, that, that you can see here, and then kind of draw the rest of it one part at a time. So here um, I'm picking that I'm drawing the head next, and so then I draw the head, um, and then I'm saying I'm drawing the body next, and I draw the body, and then I'm drawing the horn next, and I draw that. 
um, and it it kind of it goes forward from there. Um, and so this at the end you can add some details. In this case, it's a it's a bit of a sad looking sketch. Um, and the end of this, we also tell subjects to then write a brief caption that that sort of describes that or sort of a title, if you will, um, that goes with the sketch. And so we have this data set of uh, of sketches. Uh, we have 10,000 sketches for these fantastical creative depictions of birds, and we have 10,000 sketches for these uh, fantastical depictions of more generic creatures. Um, and as a very direct consequence of the interface where you're picking which part you're drawing before you draw it, we also have annotations for these strokes, uh, uh, part annotations for each of these strokes that we're seeing here. Um, and so with this data set, we then uh, trained a model on it that, that uh, tries to generate these fantastical depictions as well. And so the model is called Doodler GAN, uh, and it's a part-based GAN model that has two different parts to it. The first one is um, a part selector, where given an incomplete sketch, the model is going to decide which part it wants to draw next. Um, and the second component of this model is a part generator that given an incomplete sketch and given an indicator that tells it which part is to be drawn next, um, actually draws the part. So it decides what this part should look like and where that part should be. Um, and then once we have these two components at inference time, we can use these sequentially. Um, so we start the process with a random initial stroke, exactly how we did it when we were collecting uh, the, uh, the data set. Um, and actually is also part of the artist process that we were uh, that we were following. And so given this random initial stroke, the part selector is gonna decide which part to draw next. It's always gonna to decide to draw the eye because we had told people, we had told annotators to draw the eye as the first part. And then given the placement of the, and, and then the part generator will decide where to draw the eye and what it should look like. And then it goes back to the part selector that decides which part to draw next. And then the part gets drawn and that goes back and forth. Um, till the part selector produces a token that says that the sketch is now complete and it doesn't want to draw any more parts. Um, so this is an animation that is showing these sketches being generated one part at a time. Um, on the left are birds, on the right are more generic creatures. Um, the birds look more like birds, the creatures don't always look like creatures. Um, so we have better generation quality uh, for the birds as, as you can tell here. And there's much more room for improvement for these generic features. And you're seeing the part uh, labels on in, in the colored font. So you can tell which part the model is trying to draw next. Um, one interesting thing, and one thing you may have noticed was that our uh, sketches that are being generated are fairly low resolution. Um, and one thing that we found was we were sort of just sort of trying out these post-processing techniques to convert these um, PNGs to these sort of pixelated images to vector graphics. Um, and we found that the aesthetic that gets added to it in the process of doing this actually looks quite nice. And we found this even in human studies that um, they, they like this aesthetic as a, as a consequence of this uh, post-processing step. Um, but so that then gives us arbitrary resolution um, if, if that, was, that was important for the application. Um, we ran some uh, human studies, uh, again, for evaluation on both birds on the left and on creatures that you see on the right. Um, and what I'm showing is a comparison of our approach to um, a variety of approaches that existed at the time, things like sketch RNN um, and StyleGAN2 and so on. Um, and we were evaluating, again, various things like how creative is the sketch? Does it look like a bird? Do you like this sketch? Uh, does it look like the sketch was drawn by a human? And how well does the sketch integrate that random initial stroke that we saw at the beginning? And on the y-axis is the percentage of times that the Doodler GAN uh, generated sketch was preferred um, over the method that we are comparing to. Um, so I won't get into the details of all the trends that we are seeing here, but one interesting thing is this um, dark uh, blue, dark teal bar that you're seeing as the last one in each of these groups for, for birds. And that is actually the human drawn sketches. These are sketches from the data set that we had collected. Um, and it was interesting that uh, the Doodler GAN generated sketches was sort of at about 50% relative to those uh, that, were, that were in our data set. Um, that's not quite the case for uh, creatures. As I said, that, that is a harder uh, data set and there's much more room for improvement there. Um, we also saw what we thought <laughs> looked like uh, sketches were also sort of a hybrid of multiple creatures, which we, which we thought was interesting. 
Um, and so our data set, our code, our web demo, um, and all of that is publicly available online. Here's a quick look at, uh, at the demo. And so this is where the collaborative piece comes in. Um, as a consequence of this being a part-based model that is generating one part at a time, it very naturally lends itself to allowing a human to step in and draw some parts when they want. And so that's how we built this demo. And that's what you'll see here, where there's a random initial stroke. And then you can either let the AI, so the model draw the eye, or you can decide that you want to draw the eye yourself, or you can decide that you want to draw some other part and not the eye. The eye is what's predicted by the model right now. And so here you let the model draw the eye. And then again, you have the same set of options. You let the model draw the head and the beak um, and we can, and the body. Um, and then you decide that you, you really don't like what that looks like. And so you say that you want to be drawing the beak uh, yourself. Um, and the nice thing now is that now that you've drawn the beak, this is the incomplete sketch that is gonna go back to the model for input to decide what to do next. And so what the model decides to do next will very directly be in response to what you chose to draw. Right, so it is going to be a very collaborative setting uh, where the next step is going to depend on what you just did, um, and so the sketch can sketch can go forward from there. Um, here's maybe another example to see what that could look like. Yeah, so in, in the interest of time, I think I won't show this further. Um, but so so that was what we had in the clear paper, and then more recently this past summer, uh, we decided to. So the clear paper was just on the AI model that the model is trying to generate the sketches and that's the evaluation that we did. And then we had built this demo that allows for human AI collaboration, but we hadn't evaluated that. We hadn't seen that when a person is drawing with this AI model in the loop, is that bringing any value? Is that something people uh, enjoy? Um, is it making the sketches better or worse? And so that's what we uh, studied over this past summer where exactly like you saw in the demo, that's what you're seeing here, the similar functionality. Um, except now it's set up in this pairwise setting uh, so that on Mechanical Turk, we can either have two people that are drawing with each other um, as partners, um, or we can have a person and the AI model uh, in the same setup drawing with each other as partners. And as a baseline, we also compare it to, compare it to just a person uh, drawing these sketches on their own. Um, and so, we compared this human AI collaboration with human human collaboration with a human drawing alone. And I want to share with you sort of some high level findings of uh, what we see, what we found. Um, so one thing that we found is that participants reported an overall more fun experience in the, in the human AI condition um, uh, compared, to the, uh, compared to the other two. Um, and if you ask them, would you rather do this drawing activity with, um, uh, would you rather do it alone? Would you rather do it with a partner? Um, or sort of either way is fine. You don't really care. Then in human human, they are much more interested in uh, doing it with a partner. But even with then comparing it to human AI, but even with a human AI, they are more interested in doing it with a partner. Um, only 15% say that they would rather do it alone, and 34% are indifferent. Um, so this was nice to see. That was not obvious to me going in. Um, there was a very good chance that the model would just be annoying and people would rather uh, do it alone than have to have to interact with this model. So that was that was nice to see. Um, if you ask them who contributed more um, and you can compare human human to human AI and in the human AI setting, um, mo more people think that they contributed more, but there were 30 percent who thought that the partner contributed more um, and then 17 percent thought that they contributed equally. Um, and uh, it's interesting that when collaborating with the human, people gave a lot of credit to the other person. And this is something that we saw throughout. There was a lot of sort of kindness in, uh, in how uh, people were evaluating uh, their partner. And so here, for example, they're saying that the human partner uh, contributed more than they did. Um, if you ask them, who do you think was your drawing partner? We hadn't revealed to them whether it's a human or a machine. Um, and so it was interesting that even when the other side was a human, 8% of the times they thought that it was a machine at the other end. Um, when it was in fact a machine, then most people could tell that they're interacting with the machine, but 32% thought that it's actually a human at the other end, which, which was interesting. Um, we, can, we have a bunch of various ratings that we've derived, uh, where we've taken inspiration from computational creativity literature. Here's one of them that rates overall creativity. Um, and it turns out that uh, human AI um, collaboration is, is leading to more creative sketches than human only. Again, human human is better, um, but there is some value that the AI model is bringing uh, as compared to someone just drawing alone. 
Um, some other findings, uh, human AI drawings rated as significantly higher on creativity and artistic skill as compared to humans drawing alone. Um, people collaborating with the uh, AI enjoyed the process the most, which was interesting. So even more so than people collaborating with other humans, they enjoyed the process more with an AI. Um, people thought they were more creative than the AI partner, but would still rather have an AI partner than no partner at all. Um, people were more likely to correct the AI's parts. So there was the option of undoing and adding the part yourself. And so we thought we saw that happening more with the AI parts than with the human collaborator. Um, and it's interesting to also think about sort of the social dynamics of this, that if you think it's a machine at the other end, you might be more willing, you might be more okay with correcting them. If you think it's a person at the other end, you might be afraid of sort of offending them or something like that. And how that plays into this evaluation is something we haven't looked at yet. Um, we also had this chat interface with various prompts and I haven't talked about the details of that too much, so I'll, I'll skip this. Um, and so that's, that's, all, uh, that's all I have. That was a lot of text, so I just want to show um, some visuals of um, other sketches that were uh, generated by Doodler Gan and then went through these sort of vector graphics, um, higher resolution that you're seeing here. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll summarize. Um, I think in this general space of AI for augmenting human creativity, I think there's tremendous scope for progress and doing exciting things going forward. Um, we don't have answers to certain basic questions of what is a creativity. And I think as far as I can tell, even philosophers don't really agree on that. So I don't know if we'd make much progress on that, but this question of whatever it is that we think is valuable about creativity, how do we operationalize it? Um, what are the right domains to be looking at? What are the right tasks to be looking at? Who is the target audience, the target users? When we think about augmenting human creativity, who are these humans we are thinking of? Um, how do we evaluate? What do benchmarks look like? Uh, maybe some of these questions we could talk about in the panel. Um, and I, like I said, I think human AI collaboration is central to this when you're thinking about AI augmenting human creativity. You kind of need both of those uh, when you're thinking about it. And I think that's nice. Um, and at a higher level, like I said, at the start of my talk, uh, creativity is at the core of all progress we make um, and expressing ourselves creatively is a deeply human experience. And so if we can use AI, if we can use technology to enhance that, to augment that, um, that seems like it would be quite exciting. Um, and so with that, I'll stop and I am happy to take uh, any questions if we have time. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, terrific talk. And we have plenty of time. We have 15 minutes by my watch. Oh, wow. I Let's see. open it up <laughs> for uh, questions. And I'll just pick the questions from the list here. Song, let's start with you. Thank you, Savay. Thank you, Davi. So um, when I saw the iClear paper, I was really excited. I mean, uh, very refreshing work. I mean, so thank you for doing that work. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's the first thing I really, really want to say. And I mean, like you said, I totally agree. It's, uh, you know, it's this tremendous uh, sort of line of work. And then uh, I think it's really going to make some impact. And in particular, I didn't know about this latest work on uh, human and, I, and then uh, sort of like AI collaboration. I, I think that's just uh, absolutely great. And I also touched some of this uh, with uh, Ella just now. I don't know whether you missed that. So sketching. So what drove me into sketching is that human factor. But I've ignored the creativity side. I mean, it's somewhere down the line, but but you did it, so so that's good. You started it. So now, I I just want to uh, sort of like uh, think again on how this relates to uh, to the question asked uh, Aaron just now. So how what can we get from all that knowledge, all the creativity, and then how the drawing, you know, sort of like insights? How can we extract that and inject that into the more conventional computer vision world. So, you know, what sort of things we can inject prior knowledges and then the, like high level sort of insights into existing models so that can help us to understand the un understanding of images, of natural images better. So do you have any thoughts on that? Have you started having some uh, insights on that? Um, I don't, to be honest, and I think I think it's partly because I don't think that's what I'm trying to do. I don't think I'm looking for ways to take learnings from this and sort of inject it back into how we can do the more traditional computer vision tasks better. I think my motivation, um, in maybe a little bit in contrast to what you were saying, was coming very much from creativity, that how can we use AI to augment human creativity? And so I've, like I was mentioning in my talk, I've looked at that in various different domains. And so sketches was one of those things. So I've been thinking about it more from the other direction of 
given what we found, for example, in these human AI collaboration studies that are presented towards the end, what does that tell us about how, what role AI can play for augmenting human creativity? And can we transfer that into other domains in the creativity space of figuring out uh, what role AI can play um, in, the, in these other ones? So for example, seeing that there is a certain element of fun that people have when interacting with an AI model that is more than interacting with the other human um, is interesting to see. And I feel like that is something that can carry over. Perhaps we have to check that, but that might carry over to other domains as well, that maybe there is some. Um, so in my head, I was thinking of human alone as the baseline. And I was interested in checking whether human AI is better than human alone. And I had assumed that human human is the best case scenario. Mm-hmm. It's just that the AI model is it at least better than the human being alone. It, it, it wouldn't be uh, better than human human. But in the context of this element of fun, and we can debate about what that means and how people may have interpreted it. But in the, in the context of that, it seems like the AI models are, uh, are, are better than even having a human partner, again, in this very specific context of what we studied. So I don't want to generalize it too much, but that's an interesting finding. And I'm curious to know whether that would apply to other domains where an AI model might be an even better collaborator than another human would. Um, okay. So that's I, that's the lens with which I've, thinking, I've been thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, long road. So uh, I'm sure we'll, uh, you know, debate on this probably uh, later, uh, you know, someday. Looking forward. Yeah. yeah. Debbie, I have a question for you. I don't see any other hands up, so I'm going to steal a couple of cycles until some other hands arise. Really nice talk. Thank you. Um, um, question about the first part of your talk, the cooperative sketching. It seems as though the first couple of sketches, the first couple of strokes could be highly ambiguous. And the next person really has no idea what the first person is trying to communicate. That gives you more creativity and more variation. But I'm wondering, given that you are a language vision person as well, if the first person had communicated at least the topic of their first sketch, how do you think that would have impacted the ultimate quality of the of the result down the road? Yeah, um, that is, we had thought about elements of that. And so we do have one setting that involves language, not exactly in how you described it. Um, but I think my guess would be that, so I think there's a certain, the fact that it is ambiguous, but it also has constraints and whoever is coming next does need to respect those strokes. Um, but there is a whole bunch of things that, that like they don't know what this is telling them, but they but they are constrained by it. And there is quite a bit of uh, like it's often talked about how that is where creativity blooms, where there is that ambiguity, but you have constraints. That if you don't have any constraints and it's just completely free form, then people have a harder time being creative. Um, and if the path is sort of just set up in a very linear way, then there isn't much scope for creativity. But the soft spot of there being ambiguity, but there being constraints. Um, is often talked about as a creative spot. And so I wonder if it, maybe the language would actually make it worse. It, it, it could be one uh, outcome where now somebody is just even sort of telling you exactly what you need to do because they are guiding you in one direction. And maybe this ambiguity is bringing some value in terms of creativity. But I also do think, and I think maybe that is what you were alluding to, that some of the chaos is probably coming because people don't know what's going on and now they are adding more to it and it gets worse from there. Right. So I'd be curious which way the average goes, but I suspect yeah. that we might see both cases um, yeah. if we were to do this, yeah. Excellent, yeah. Uh, the second question I have pertains to the other part of the talk, and that is, I'm wondering what, how you could sort of incorporate some of the priors and expertise of professional cartoonists into your framework to sort of guide it towards, you know, constrained creativity that people enjoy ultimately. <laughs> Yeah, that would be uh, that would be awesome if we had uh, some way of doing that. Um, that would be neat. I mean, the the uninteresting uh, way that comes to mind is that if we had a bunch of data from professionals, um, then that would be one way of guiding the model to behave that way. But I think it would be even more interesting if we had a sense for the frameworks that professionals are using when they are when they are sort of making these cartoons and sketches and adding that in as inductive biases in some way to the model. Um, I'm also thinking about the, like if you look at the books that teach you how to draw cartoons, 
it often starts with like these ellipses of like, this is the head and this is the body, and then you add detail to it. Um, and so there being this maybe library of shapes or sort of primitives that you're starting yeah. with and forcing the model to kind of go through that process of like a course layout and then maybe adding detail that's more freeform, um, that might be interesting. And that's also an interesting opportunity for collaboration that is it better for the AI model to kind of lay out the course to produce the course layout and then the human brings the details um, or is it better for a human in terms of sort of having their voice depicted where they can dictate the process more so maybe the human lays out the layout and then the model adds the details um, and yeah it's unclear uh, which one would be better in terms of both the final sketch being nicer more creative with whatever evaluation metric but also in terms of how the person feels that does the person did they enjoy the process more um, and did they feel like this is their sketch like do they feel like they contributed to it or does it feel like the model just kind of took over and yes the sketch looks nice but my voice isn't represented there and i don't think you i don't think you want that when you're thinking about using ai for augmenting human creativity um, yeah you wonder if there you know are there sort of fundamental principles of you know topological closure and symmetry and whatever things that at least give you a good scaffold, right? You don't want to vary too far beyond some of these rules, right? But then you don't want to inhibit the creativity that you're that you're trying to elicit. So you wonder if there's that sweet spot, just like the first question, right? If yep. if if there's no, you know, no guidance at all, and you're giving me this bad starting point for something, I think we're going in this direction. I've got to work with this bad heterogeneous <laughs> data you're giving me, and I'll 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 make the best of it. But what's the odds that I'm going to end up with something that somebody likes at the end of the day, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so I think Yulia has her hand up. Yeah, I want to ask um, somewhere in the slides, sir. First of all, thank you. Very interesting talk. Um, I want to ask somewhere in the slides. You mentioned that a human AI was rated as more creative. How did you measure cre creativity in in this case? We very directly asked people <laughs> which sketch do you think so, um, is a is a more creative sketch. Um, so do, do you know what people would uh, would uh, mean by being more creative, um, more stranger? <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that is a great question. And that goes to what I was saying on my last slide that I think there isn't, as far as I can tell, and this can, yeah, we could talk about this in the panel more as well, that there isn't an agreed upon definition of what creativity means, um, even among sort of the computational creativity literature or even among philosophers from what I can tell. But a recurring theme that I have seen and that I have found relevant is this mix of unusualness, but quality. So if you have something that is very unusual, but it doesn't feel like it has value, it doesn't feel like it is high quality, then that's just, it can be sort of random noise, right? Random noise can be unpredictable, um, but it's not gonna have quality. And so that doesn't work. And on the other hand, you can have something that is very high quality, but if it's very predictable, um, then it's not going to seem creative. And so uh, one uh, definition is that it is this combination of the two, um, which is what we do. That, that is part, that is exactly why we also measure those individually. For example, both in, in both parts of the talk, but we also ask people which sketch just looks better. And we also ask them which sketch is more um, unpredictable, which sketch is more surprising. And we have the separate question of which one is more creative. And in the work that I've done so far, we do see that the creative rating does end up being um, a, a mix of those two, that an approach that has good ratings on both quality and not being and being surprising or not predictable tends to be the one that is also rated as more creative. Um, but I don't, yeah, beyond that, I don't know what people uh, must be thinking when we ask them which one is more creative. I'm thinking now, uh, maybe one thing also to try to raise creativity is to see how um, people drawings uh, change over time, because I suppose then you're not very creative, you'll produce the same drawing all over, right? It, it, it can be actually looking creative at first, but maybe after several attempts, it will not be creative. And that's where collaborating with people and AI would probably diversify a lot what you're producing. Yeah, yeah. And, and that goes to that when we say unpredictable, unpredictable relative to what distribution, right? That is it unpredictable given so is it unpredictable given what i have done in the past in which case i am being creative relative to my history versus is it something that we've just never seen for example in the art community like if you think about fine art and sort of all of that 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 is just sort of a new movement that has started that no one had done before 
Um, and so there are these different uh, levels or gradations of creativity um, that get talked about with like P creativity, C creativity and things of that sort. So yeah, so that makes sense. So Debbie, we, I think we have time for one more question and it looks like Pinaki typed in something in the chat. So maybe rather than me waste time reading it, why don't you have a quick look and see if you'd like to oh. respond to that. Yeah, so like basically, that, yeah. like I can like uh, so there are like two 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 parts in this creative sketch process. Uh, the first being like you choose a body part, and then you draw the body part. I mean the way the creative GAN works. Now, I, drawing a body part that's where I understand because uh, like you're drawing a body part and uh, you can draw that part creatively. You can draw a beak in a very different ways. Now, where is the choosing a body part coming in? Like uh, like suppose. Um, which body with the order because you have fixed number of body parts, say you know, like 10 body parts and the order of the body parts that you have chosen, specifically for the cases when you're drawing a bird itself. Like, do you like, why do you like, where is the create? Like I, I'm, I'm trying to understand where is the creativity there in choosing a body part and not drawing the body. Drawing the body part is okay, but choosing which body part to draw in which order to draw. So, so the creativity angle in that respect, or like what is the motivation of choosing the body part and making that also Learn, uh, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the computational part? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So the, the motivation behind uh, setting the model up where it is choosing the body part, the motivation there is not to increase the creativity of the sketch. It's actually to increase the quality of the, to the, of the sketch, to be honest. So the idea being that if we have these part generators on a per part basis, where there's one generator that's just responsible for generating eyes, there's one generator that's just responsible for generating the beaks and so on, then that will result in higher quality of beaks and eyes um, and things of that sort. Um, but then if you break it down by parts, then there needs to be something else in the model that's deciding which part you want to draw next. And that's where uh, the part uh, selector comes in, um, in the context of the AI model. So yeah, the motivation behind that is to increase the quality, not necessarily, which plays a role in the creativity, but it's not to increase the unusualness. It's not to increase the unpredictability. The other and perhaps more important value that that part selector brings is this ability of human AI collaboration. Because it is a part-based model, it very naturally sets itself up to the, that the model draws apart and then the human draws apart and they can go back and forth. Um, which I think is, uh, which is, yeah. So I think that is a natural way of setting up collaboration. So that's the other value that I think the part selector brings. Okay, great, great. The collaboration aspect, yeah, thank you. Great, thanks, Debbie. I think I think we're out of time. It's 5.15 uh, on behalf of everybody, Debbie, just let me express our sincerest thanks, wonderful talk and best of luck with this line of work. Really exciting. <laughs>